Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the keynote address of this year's Global Negotiation Conference. Um, my name is Jack Williams, and I'm the president of the Institute for Global Negotiation, which is organizing the event with the kind support of the Chair of Political Philosophy and the Euro Europa Institute of the University of Zurich. So the Global Negotiation Conference, for those of you who don't know, um, <coughs> is an annual event where teams of graduate students come to take part in a series of presentations and workshops by leading practitioners and academics. Um, and it culminates in a day-long negotiation simulation on a current global issue. And this year, the issue is going to be on negotiating new principles um, for the exploration of out of space. So we're looking to the future in that respect. Now, um, a highlight of the conference is um, the keynote address, so the public keynote address, um, delivered by an eminent figure in politics and diplomacy, um, who we invite to share with us their reflections on their experience, um, and also um, looking to the future um, from what they've learned. So we're very privileged to have with us this evening Talia Hallonen, um, the former president of Finland. So she served a prin uh, as the president of Finland from 20, to, well, 2000 to 2012. Prior to her election, she held the offices of Minister of Social Affairs and Health, Minister of Justice, and Minister of Foreign Affairs. She continues to work closely with the United Nations um, and is currently a member of the Secretary General's Ad High Level Advisory Board of Mediation. She is also an EU, uh, UN Land Ambassador, as well as a member of the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaties Organizations, so CB, CTBTO, um, group of eminent persons. She continues to promote issues related to sustainable development in her many other roles, including as a member of the Sustainable Development Solutions Network's Leadership Council, as chair of the Lancet Site Commission on Peaceful Societies through Health and Gender Equality, and as a member of Harvard University's Arctic Initiative, uh, the Board of Advisors. Sorry if this is becoming too much. <laughs> um, no, no, I think so that they understand already by looking at me that I'm already who can say no. <laughs> no. Um, and in Finland, she is also on the board of Citra, the Finnish Innovation Fund, and is also the chairperson of the board of directors of the Finnish National Gallery. So we're incredibly honored um, that she has taken the time to come and address our conference. Um, so, President Hallinen, uh, thank you for being with us this evening, and the floor is yours. Thank you. <laughs> so, yeah, I always feel myself a very old one when I listen to this, yeah, with what we have done. Uh, but luckily, he didn't know everything. So, uh, I will also add that I'm also the grandmother of the five grandchildren. So don't remember to enjoy your life. So, but it is very wonderful to be with you today. So um, I have heard a little bit about what you will do, and um, you have exciting days uh, ahead of you, and you will not only get to hear from good speakers, I, I think so, and teachers, but you will also have a uh, possibility to, uh, to have a meeting each other and Believe or not, the coffee breaks are sometimes the most important issue in international conferences. It's not undermining the issues, but telling that, that meeting persons face to face, having a contact, it can last more than 40 years in your life. At least it has happened with me, as we are also the old friends. So, um, so uh, the subject itself is very interesting. I gave a speech, um, it was in 2019, uh, during International Space Week, uh, where I underlined how space science and technology have a crucial role in ensuring the sustainable future of our planet. Um, they can provide us with um, information and knowledge needed to achieve sustainable development, but 
we also have to have a common rules in place for peaceful and sustainable use and exploration of the outer space. So um, these all link to what I'm planning to, to talk, to discuss with you today. Uh, I will speak um, a little bit about uh, multilateralism and political decision making, and I hope to have the time to discuss with all of you after that. And then I apologize beforehand. I have the water, and I have two types of the tablets, because I had about a month or six weeks ago, I had a COVID-19, and I still have a cough. Uh, but if you are just uh, waiting for the wise, or I stop coughing, and then I can speak again, because I have an unusually long speeds. Be careful and don't sleep, I see you all. So the first uh, introduction is that why do I want to start with multilateralism? Because I think uh, seriously that the challenges of today uh, simply require this kind of the solutions. The risk that threaten us, our lives and well-being, I could say even uh, the whole existence of the humanity I do not respect state borders. I already mentioned the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, it has not gone away, and it should be um, our last wake-up call. So <clears throat> in addition to COVID-19, we are going through multiple crises. If I start the list and you continue it in your mind, uh, we have the climate change, devastating wars, including in Ukraine caused by Russian invasion, we have a global food crisis, we have an economic downfall, and I have just mentioned a few, and you can add it to your list. At the same time, when we need a multilateral cooperation more than ever, so United Nations, UN, um, other multilateral organizations, and the whole rule-based international system has been battling against a strong headwind. So in recent years, some countries, big and small, have taken a more nationalistic or even isolationistic worldview. But we must underline that self-centered approaches to global problems simply do not work. Communication between different players can be challenging, as uh, there can be many opinions and approaches to single topic. This um, was also evident during the COVID-19 pandemic when different experts and uh, had different views on how to contain the virus. I take one example. I take the most of the examples from my own country in order to be sure that I don't hurt anybody's own national feelings. So uh, our young, young and uh, very, very, very energetic, good uh, Prime Minister, uh, Sanna Marin, uh, I think that you have seen her picture in many places. Um, I remember when I, I have been encouraging them to continue in difficult times. So uh, she was very surprised that when she has thought that this government finally now will do something what we can say to facts and science-based politics, that, that they really listen carefully, all five party leaders who were in the government, all women, by the way. So, um, so uh, then when they heard and listened experts, I think it was also like you, that they had all all the time, different kind of opinions. They were very, very eager to tell them why just their opinion is correct. And, and I think that this might be also a surprise for many others, that those who seem to be the very cool scientific experts, so that they have, they have so different, different uh, so big differences. So, so it's, it's very important that... Uh, you find solutions to the complex problems. You learn also this what's uh, mediation, and you can see the steps as a part of the bigger way. So now, there, my yeah, there is already my my favorite favorite picture. So, <clears throat> as I mentioned, the multilateral institutions and the rules-based international order have been facing difficulties in recent years. Uh, but I'm not really come here to share only bad news with you. I think that we, we, both, we can see the world then. The world has taken big steps recent years. Uh, in, uh, in 2015, all countries of the United Nations 
came together to agree on the Sustainable Development Agenda. <clears throat> So-called Agenda 2030 is a holistic framework which aims for a more prosperous, equal, socially just and ecologically sustainable future for our planet uh, based on human rights. So, um, is, as you see there, the Sustainable Development Agenda contains 17 different goals. Um, and now, the, for the first time, it includes environmental, social, and economic development under one framework. So, um, the problems of the SDG agenda addresses are, they are complex, they are demanding, and require international cooperation across all scientific disciplines and knowledge communities. But um, something which is very special, and I underline it, a particular feature of the Sustainable Development Goals of Agenda is that they are all interlinked. They are there now in one picture, and, uh, and you can think, like I say, for the younger students, I always say that you can see it like a house with the 70 doors. So you can draw it for you, that, that's it. And uh, we can all choose, and you will choose, which door you will take and which goal we advance. But we, you have to keep in mind that all doors take us to the same place. So you can do your favorites, but favorites are not working alone. Uh, anybody playing the basketball or the football? Hands up. Oh, yeah. You know that it's not enough that you have the stars. They have to be a team. And this is a little bit the same. Okay. So <clears throat> all countries, they are responsible for putting the goals into practice. But it is necessary to have the involvement of many different players, from civil society to private sector, also at the national level. So uh, we think we are thought to be always very modest, and it's, it's very difficult to say that we are good in something. But now, according to the international statistics, we can say also, uh, trying to be humble, but tell that <coughs> we have done something good. And uh, so we are very happy, we are proud that Finland took the top spot on this year's uh, SD, SDGs index with the progress on sustainable development goals. Finland has been one of the pioneers in implementation of Agenda 2030, and my country has brought together actors from different fields to promote these goals. And I think this is an important message. You need uh, different actors from the society. So, um, and of course, for us, for you, for your countries, it's, uh, it's quite good. You can celebrate the development, what has been done so far, but then it's as important or even more that we continue. And um, the speed and scale of the actions towards these crucial goals do have to be hurried to achieve them before 2030. It's not a miracle year, but it's a way how we have counted that it's easier to do now than in the future. So <clears throat> exactly the same year, 2015, the world also adopted the Paris Climate Agreement and also the Sendai Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction. And as with sustainable development overall, a lot must be done to achieve these commitments. But uh, <clears throat> these important steps signal that multilateral decision making is not dead. It's needed, we have succeeded, and let's see also this satisfied. But then how? And now you will get a nice picture from the bee nest. Okay. This is still easy, and we will have a more fragmented in the future. <clears throat> so the multilateral decision making is really the only way to address global problems. Um, I come from the small country of 5.5 uh, million people, and I often say that we, the small countries, we are naturally more internationalists than the bigger ones, because we understand more easily that uh, we cannot change the world alone. But if you come from the bigger countries, so you can tell it also back home, nobody is big enough to do it alone. So. <clears throat> 
UN and several other international governmental organizations were set up after the devastating and horror of the Second World War. You have heard this many times, but it's still important to underline. When that war finally ended, the world famously said, never again. Never again genocide, never again wars, never again the use of nuclear weapons. It had become obvious that humanity had the ability to destroy itself and life on Earth unless this was actively prevented together. So <clears throat> here we have to note that United Nations and other organizations were set up by the so-called winners, winners of the Second World War, and this continued to be visible in this day. More about that later. So <clears throat> the UN Charter, which is signed in 1945, laid out the determination to save the humanity from war, uphold human rights, equal rights of women and men, although today, of course, we say that there are more genders, but that's a good start, and to uphold rule-based international order and promote social progress. So I love to repeat that the second Secretary General of the United Nations, the Swedish Doug Hammarskjöld, stated in his famous words that UN was not created to lead humanity to heaven, but to save it from hell. So, <coughs> unfortunately, hell has been quite close several times after that. I could say that the door has been almost open. We have not been able to prevent all genocides, the, and the wars are currently also in many parts of the world, including now in Europe. However, UN have also been a success in many ways. The UN was founded on three pillars. I don't ask you should remember them, of course, you remember them well, and these are peace and security, human rights, and development. And after 75 years, the basic idea continues to be relevant. There is no security without development, no development without security, and no security or development without human rights. And that's still true. So the UN Universal Declaration of Human Rights was adopted a few years after the founding of the United Nations, and it was revolutionary. Sometimes we, and especially the younger generation, take it like it would be always. No, it's not. Uh, humanity moved from the absolute sovereignty of the countries and rules towards a new kind of cooperation and responsibility. So since then, several legally binding human rights treaties have been agreed upon. They create a framework for the protection and promotion of human rights. Uh, the work of UN special organizations on the ground on this context is very important. So <clears throat> sometimes I got the questions, and I steal one of the questions beforehand, that it seemed to be so that we have so many different kind of human rights agreements that only the men are without a special human rights uh, agreement. And so I say that you can think that um, the original human rights declaration and agreement, it has been like a blanket. And it has been thought that it will protect all of us. But then you have got either so that the blanket has not been quite well done or that it's worn out, but you have the holes on, on the blanket. And then we always put the pets there and there and there. And of course, it's a good question that why don't you do the new one? Why don't you are uh, putting these patches? But then I always say that the reason is that we are not smart, clever, and unanimous enough to do that. And that's why we always try to find that where is the biggest holes. Okay. So, I think that uh, after all that, it could be said that the greatest achievement of the United Nations is anyway, despite several serious wars, that the world has not slipped into the Third World War. Um, but the um, UN has plenty of the smaller achievements also. 
During its history, UN has saved millions of lives and led the foundation for reasonably st stable international order. And now you will get a fantastic picture. And you can try to take a photo. You find it also in UN own pages. You don't need to do that. And don't try to read it. At least the last row. So um, it's only to show that uh, it is pretty complex organization, isn't it? And this is almost a British understatement. But um, this is it. And it's not the whole picture either. So um, the United Nations now provides a forum for structured dialogue among its 193 uh, member states, observe, and then they are the observers and other stakeholders. So political decisions by member states are made in its main organs, General Assembly, Security Council, and ECOSOC. So sustainable development very much on, in ECOSOC. Secretary General heads the UN Secretariat. UN special art organizations and uh, funds and programs exist under General Assembly and, as I mentioned, ECOSOC. So organizations, funds, and programs under the UN do very good work in many fields. The work on the ground on issues relating to the sustainable development, gender equality, children's rights, sexual and reproductive health and rights, food security, uh, desertification, just to mention some of the areas, and I have chosen that just what I know myself. So it's not an order of the importance. So um, uh, we hear every now and then, and now, of course, after this Ukraine issue, um, we have uh, heard the discussions on the work of the uh, United Nations Security Council. But as I mentioned to you already earlier, its permanent membership is based on the result of the Second World War. And those five members, USA, China, France, Russia, and UK, have a veto power in this system making. Uh, of course, Security Council has also non-permanent rotating members, uh, 10 pieces, but the veto power has shown to be able to be the, how could I say, it's, it's important, but it can also, like it has done sometimes, to paralyze the work of the Security Council. You very often, some of those permanent members are guilty by themselves, and so they can say that, no, they use the veto. And uh, so um, now it is a kind of a situ situation. Uh, Security Council has been unable to do anything with regards to the war in Ukraine, as its permanent member, Russia, is that one who has, uh, who ha who has made this conflict. So <clears throat> some of you might hear, especially those who come outside of Europe, some other cases where some other <laughs> member, uh, members of these five have <laughs> had a similar, not quite the same, but similar situation. So, and we can discuss about that later on. And uh, the truth is anyway that this can lead to many end results in the future. So we can see that what we can do then, if we cannot agree that we could make a different kind of security council, and we know that any of those five will say that no. Uh, but then it can happen, and it has already happened that, that um, General Assembly steps uh, in where the Security Council is unable to take a stand. And of course, even it's deci not decisive, it's politically anyway important. There can be also other, other ways, uh, uh, for instance, that uh, some other organizations will take that and, and so on. And if you are interested in mediation, you, I, can, I can guarantee that it's not easier. But um, um, I have thought sometimes knowing the last three secretary generals, that it has had also impact to the authority of UN to mediate the conflicts and the possibilities of the secretary general to do something. So who could be the other ones? So regional organizations and, and some other, of course the United Nations is not, no, it's not only in governmental organization in the world. We have several regional organizations 
that they work towards the, luckily, most of them for to the similar goals. Council of Europe, um, OECD, European Union, they are for us, now you are in Switzerland, they are very important due to Europe, uh, but there are also many others. Africa Union is a very strong one, ASEAN, CARICOM, OECD, and you have the lists in your mind for some others that I have not mentioned now. So regional organizations that can play a very important role uh, in its own region, regional security, and also in development. Sometimes when global agreements are quite impossible, commitments can be made regionally. They can also be the first steps to agree with a, with a, more, with a, with a broader principle. Just to mention about your baby, just relax. My children have be become quite decent persons with also sleeping in the meetings. <laughs> so good luck. <laughs> So, speaking about the other actors, of course, the picture is not even that simplistic. Uh, multilateralism has been changing, um, and it faces both challenges but also opportunities. Increasing competition between great powers poses challenges to cooperation. So, informal forms of multilateralism, like such as um, G7, there's also G, G8 and G20 and whatever are these Gs. They are important, but they are exclusive decision-making forums. You cannot belong those, just telling that we will want to join. So they are, they are not in that way equal, but important. Also strong and still increasing influence of private sector, and in many cases civil society, are all part of the big picture. Um, and um, this is really important in our time of internet and media. Um, I think that many of you are also activists in different organizations, and you know pretty well already that how to work on those. Um, so last week I participated in the big health security conference in Singapore. It was a World Health Organization system, but um, it was also so the, those who were active to organize it were few countries, not all, and, uh, but I think it succeeded pretty well. So another example, um, today they count that 55% of the global population live in cities, um, and this figure is rising, it will be quite soon the 70%, and many cities have taken leading roles uh, in fighting climate change, uh, especially when the national efforts have, have failed. And uh, also now, in the time of the COVID-19, um, the city's role was very, very important. And um, there are many others as kind of the systems. And the more we want to get a decentralized system in different countries, the more also these interlinkages become also important. So, very often with the students I ask that, do you know that who are doing these decisions? And quite often people don't know their own representatives. Not by name, but not from which parties they are, how they do. They don't know that what the persons have done in different meetings. And that will be very important to know. And uh, so my big question is who? Along, along with the multilateral cooperation, attention, attention must be paid to who, whose voice is heard and whose voice is not. Uh, in UN, the decisions are made, as you know, by the member state governments. In some countries, like my own one, uh, officer delegations include civil society organizations, and civil society is widely heard also to the national opinions and uh, they are included in decision-making and implementation, also, for instance, in sustainable development. Uh, we have, of course, we have the National Commission, the Officer Committee, but then we have also the Shadow Commission by the civil society, and that helps sometimes to make a broader picture. So, um, in some other countries, I don't mention any names, civil society can be completely banned 
or the space to operate is very limited. And in that case, the voice of the country can be, how could I say, only with uh, one single party or even single leader alone. And um, uh, my country, I know it very well. We have, uh, with the others, uh, have pushed for the more inclusive United Nations, including more participation from the civil society. Uh, there we can come back to the discussion that which kind of the format they, they are. Uh, then I take one, not an, perhaps a minority, can be just now the minority, but you guess already, thinking my own background, that what I will speak, the group, and they are women, of course. So, in addition, the women are clear minority when it comes to the leadership positions, although they are very important persons in improving the sustainability of society uh, when they are involved in decision making. So, <clears throat> uh, if we speak now about the peace and security, take that away, Maria, because they, it can interfere their feelings. Let's give more room for, that's a good one, keep that so we are more peaceful. So the rule-based international order is the backbone of the international predictability, security, and stability. This is, in turn, this in turn forms a fertile ground to the stable, peaceful, and hopefully democratic societies. When we discuss negotiations, I always to remind, I have been also when I was young, reminded that, that it's, uh, it is important not to only negotiate with friends or like-minded people. It might be easier, much nicer, but uh, if we want to make a change and agree on important global goals or even smaller goals, we need to discuss and work with those who have different opinions, opinions that we have sometimes difficult to understand. And it is important to get people from different backgrounds, genders, and ethnicities on board. So um, this becomes even more important when we discuss conflicts and mediation. I have been, I have been part of the Secretary General Antonio Guterres, high level advisory board, like it was mentioned, on mediation. So he has handpicked the group and has wanted to have different areas of the expertise in the group so they are, we are not representative of the government. And it's Secretary General who has picked up us. And, um, and for, for example, um, I was chosen because of my background in human rights and sustainable development, not because I would be an expert in mediation. Uh, and um, I, I agree in many cases uh, the way how the Guterres thinks about the conflicts and mediation. Guterres has thought that priority for that is a conflict prevention. As he has said, conflicts do not appear out of the thin air. There are always reasons and root causes and they are preventable. Sustainable development is in the heart of the conflict prevention. Uh, and what are the root causes of conflict? It can be anything from poverty to the climate change to lack of water to corruption and failure of the governance systems. Um, but uh, it can be also sometimes quite crazy reasons, but still important. For instance, the picture of the, of the people or the leaders about the history of their country or, or different kind of such issues or the religion. And, why they are just an elite people by the God, or many, many other things. But then if we think that, how then to mediate? So studies show that the gender equality is one of the best uh, predictors of peace. Inequalities fuel conflicts. Women often suffer uh, much, perhaps the most, from the consequences of conflicts. For example, gender violence increases during the crisis, and uh, it has happened already now with the Ukrainian case, not only in the Ukraine or the neighboring uh, countries, but for instance, we heard from the human rights experts that for instance in New York, now the violence is concerning women 
uh, is now three times bigger than it was before. I mean that somehow it's like on COVID-19 that it spreads very easily, takes away how to think. And um, so um, uh, also the civilian casualties are high. So well, coming back to women, women keep the society running during the conflicts. Uh, they also can and should play, of course, because of that, an important role in resolving conflicts. It is sort of absurd that those who are responsible for the conflicts uh, are normally the ones who are given the responsibility for peace. No, no, I understand that you have to negotiate with warlords in order to get a ceasefire, at least. But... Um, in order to build sustainable peace, the participation must be much wider. Um, the old saying goes that peace is not just the absence of the war. There are many other issues that come into play. And that's why we have to work in, in, order, to, uh, in order to, how could I say, uh, to really to get the ceasefire, to make the arms silent. But then you need also those who know how to, how to make the society to work. So, <clears throat> then a few words about women in peace table. Again, there are people whose voices are very needed, and the women are those. It's very important to include also civil society, the women's group, human rights activists, youth groups, in peace talks in order to address the underlying political, economic, and social problems, and to build sustainable, lasting peace. This is also the groundwork for the rebuilding and successful society. The studies show that when women are at the peace table, so the peace agreements are not easier to reach, but they last longer and they are more inclusive. This is fact, yet in the past uh, 10 years, women were an average just that 13, one, three, percent of negotiators, six percent of the mediators, and six percent of uh, those who signed the major peace processes worldwide. So at least this does not make sense for me. Um, we lose lives and we lose money because senseless gender stereotypes rooted deep in our societies. So it's not only only the peace tables where there is a gender imbalance, but it's also true in diplomacy. Um, I remember from my own past when I was a foreign minister in Finland in uh, 1995 to 2000 that, that we normally had only two female ambassadors among our ambassadors. Today, 20 years later, we have half and half about. And it it has not made our country worse, on the contrary. So um, I take another example from the UN. Um, I happen to be also the member of the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty Group of so-called eminent persons, and our aim is to advocate the ratification of the treaty, which is a long way. So the radiation released from the use and testing Testing of nuclear weapons tends to lead to more severe health problems among women, yet nuclear disarmament negotiations are still predominantly con conducted by men. Um, the same goes with an international discussion on arms control, diplomacy where gender balance is still far from the being realized. UN study shows that the women comprise just uh, 32 percent of uh, participants in disarmament related meetings. So. Then a few words still, not too many, about the warfare and mediation. So mediation and the conflict prevention have been long-running priorities in my own country's foreign policy, and we have uh, always emphasized meaningful participation of women, young people, and religious actors in peace processes, so the religion doesn't make the war. It can also help to stop the war. And um, when it comes to the armed conflicts of today, they are quite different from the time when the Geneva Convention were agreed. It was mainly 1949. Um, these days, it is unusual to have a clear-cut conflict between two countries. Uh, conflicts tend to be more 
chaotic, more difficult to understand, and often several unofficial armed factions or armed groups and rebel groups take part in the conflict, or the civil war spread over the borders and become internationalized so far. And even it would be something what you think that this is a civil war, there are always the outsiders who are also financing the, the issue. Uh, in the fact, the current war in Ukraine is quite unusual, as it started by one country attacking another. But of course, even there, in the Ukraine case, the Russia does not even call the situation a war, but a special military operation. And countries quite rarely want to name their actions as a war because they don't want to make themselves bound to the international humanitarian law, so-called Geneva Conventions. And I have for a long time championed also for the more comprehensive approach to the security and um, has been demonstrated in that way. Uh, traditional armed conflicts have not disappeared, but they are now at the same time. Uh, and so, however, our collective security is also affected at the same time, environmental degradation, um, we have the human rights violence, health security, and many other such kind of things. And we cannot say for the climate change that, wait a minute, that we have now this war first. But it's going, and that's important to, to remember. But then some other issues, just to mention some titles. Uh, I'm very fond of the peace education. And um, in this context, it's good to underline that negotiation skills are also an important tool in building peace and democracy in one society. Uh, I, my first, first uh, role after the university, university issues has been that I was 10 years a union lawyer, so I'm a partly syndicalist. And I know how important it is in working places that you can negotiate. But the peace education is also meant to build peaceful and safe societies and to understand, of course, the global responsibility, but also to understand that people have different kind of interests. They have also the different kind of opinions based on that. And what I always say, and this is not so common in many countries, that peace education is important to start from the young age. Instead, in, instead of undermining the fights of children, you know how the elderly people ah, they are just learning to live when it's uh, fights in the, in the playground. No, it's not so. Let's teach already children uh, how to approach, approach conflicts in a non-violent way, whatever it's a question there. But if we always think and to say that the strong woman will win and show it back, so we make also the base for violent behavior. So, uh, and just mentioning the raising the voices of the minorities, we, we need them. Um, urgent problems to require multi, multiply actors, and we, are, we have the groups and voices whose voices are not heard enough, and we should get, we should harness knowledge from the different knowledge communities, and uh, then when you are now at the university side, you should also remember that academia is very important for them. It's not just for your own studies, but you can also be, be on bridge builders with the, with the societies. So, and then, of course, young people. Um, it's good. I feel very much a sympathy for the youngest ones today because I think that they are often ahead in climate actions and efforts to forward sustainable goals. Children have been quite easy at the schools to, to learn to eat more green uh, ones, uh, and, and they even teach their own parents and grandparents. Uh, and they quite realistically they understand that their future will be that one. They will suffer most when we, the former generations have already disappeared. But one thing more, I think that many of you have thought it already, um, I want to mention was indigenous communities. They have also a lot of crucial knowledge in different areas of the climate change and how to avoid the nature. And, and this is that. And the last thing, I'm happy that we have at least one who is the sport person, perhaps also the others. So the, <coughs> nowadays they teach 
little boys and girls also, that they should already know what they do in sports when they are six years old. And they are seeing that who has these capabilities. And still the coaches say that the best experts come from those who have been first generalists. And this is exactly the same concerning society and science. You have to be interested, eager to know the things, all the sectors of the society, because then we come back to these goals. You can be, then you can choose your favorite part. But it's very, very important that you know also the other pieces of the cake. And um, so um, um, I, I underline also the fact that, for instance, in Finland, we have the quota of the 40% of women and men. Uh, currently, the law considers only two genders, but still in planning and decision-making bodies of the central and local government. And uh, I always like to remind or my May friends, but I have many, who, but some of them think that it only benefits women. When we made this already about 30 years ago in, in, in uh, Finland, so in Parliament, uh, the men said that. And so we said, that not concerning you, but your sons and your grandsons will be happy that it's a 40% rule. And that's true in many sectors. And we had used it in many sectors, for instance, in health and social welfare, also in some other parts, education and culture, that we say that they have to be also men. They are also very interesting human persons. They know something. And believe it or not, it's a good rule. So the multilateralism, as I have tried to explain to you, it's important, more important than ever. And that's why I do hope that you find also during the lessons and during the coffee breaks, how to have a different opinions and still respect each other and try to find a certain type of the compromises. And uh, so that's it. And now it's your turn. Um, so thank you very much. Um, if you have a question, if you could put up your hand, um, and then I'll, I'll try to come to you. Yeah. Um, so just indicate. Yeah. And if you could say your name before you. Hello, good afternoon. Thank you for, for being here. My name is Daniel. I am uh, from uh, the small island of Malta. And oh, I have been there. Yeah, 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 I know you. Yeah. And I'm a student of the Diplomatic Academy in Malta. I have uh, two questions, if I may, and uh, relating to, uh, to two aspects of diplomacy. One is small states diplomacy, coming from a small state, and another one coming from perhaps a new er area of diplomacy, which is corporate diplomacy. So for the first part, as a small state, Malta um, has just been voted in on the United Nations Security Council with the mandate starting next January. What is the role of such small, tiny states, I would say, when negotiating on behalf of so many big countries at such an important table, at such an important juncture in history. What can such a small state bring to the table? And secondly, as you've been mentioning, um, we have global issues that transcend borders. And many times when we talk about multilateral, uh, multilateralism, we're talking about states but there are definitely stakeholders who are not at times front of mind. And to me, this brings the idea of corporate diplomacy. Today you have companies, multinational corporations, whose turnover is bigger than the GDP of some countries. Shell, for example, you were talking about resources, have a diplomatic complement in, in certain countries in Africa that rivals that of modern nation states. Isn't it time that we as diplomats understand better the good and the bad and the ugly of corporate diplomacy? At the start of this current um, uh, conflict in Ukraine, there was a prime important um, uh, point that was Nord Stream 2, and there was Gazprom involved. Gazprom 
This chairman is Gerard Schroeder, who was, was um, Chancellor of Germany. So here we're seeing revolving door, corporates having very, very um, important access to politicians who can bring good and bad to multilateralism. Those are two, my two questions. Thank you. Yeah. The first, um, uh, with the small countries, of course, I'm not objective because I come also myself from the small country. But uh, you can also see that, uh, for instance, the <coughs> secretary generals of the UN, they are quite often from the smaller countries, Sweden, Norway, uh, also now the Portugal, not too, too big one. Um, then also in the negotiations, uh, when you are small, you are, so, you are not considered to be certain type of the risk. You can more concentrate to the issue, what they say, but then you have to be smart. So I mean that um, when the bigger countries do it, it's very easy, the political, political issue, that whether you accept what the big country A or B has said or accepted. But if the smaller countries, like Switzerland is very clever on that, if, if they uh, uh, offer the, as we say, the, the, the house and water, <laughs> and so it starts by, by doing the, the trust relationship. And then you listen more easily in the other ones. This is not forbidden by the big ones. I mean, you can do the same, but smaller ones have uh, learned very often to, to listen. But uh, I would say that quantity and quality are two different things. You can offer the quality, and then those who have also the quality, uh, and quality and then those who have the quantity, so they, of course, decide what to do. But the problem is, of course, that if such kind of the trend what today seem to be increasing, that the big ones only negotiate with each other, so that will be very dangerous. Um, and that's why I, I mentioned cautiously, but with respect, that all these G, this and that, G, seven, fives, and 20, and so on. And they are important because, especially in sustainable solutions, they make a difference much so easier. A big country, for instance, uh, is committed to, to do the good uh, use of the water or something like that, so it can help you, you make a bigger difference. But sometimes the smaller countries can, can show that you can live in very decent way uh, according the rules. I think that one of the good examples, of course, I'm not objective, have been the Nordic countries. That if you look at the different statistics, what's welfare in these countries, and they are all small, I mean, internationally taken. So it has been worth of living uh, with the rule-based society. Uh, Malta is a very good example, by the way, you can discuss with him, uh, that uh, they, they have been so strongly two-party system that we always, in the past, in the EU, we asked that uh, which party is now winning because they were either very eager to the EU or, or not that eager to the EU, but then finally you win. So it's, uh, I mean, that um, it's one of the problems of the two-party system, that you are with me or against me, with him, and so. But uh, if you have uh, also, when you think you have worked perhaps in the future at the national level, so it's not bad if you have really the multi-party system. It's not so clear cut. It's not certain type of political jam, but it, it gives much more possibilities because you never know that who is the next one to ask you to dance the tango. And then you have to behave more more decently. Yeah, but um, I think Muta is a good example also. You are not yet so active what has been the Switzerland, for instance, or Sweden or Norway, but that demands also the money, of course. But, yeah. yeah, so go on, you can be a good example. And I, my respect concerning the refugees, yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay, next. Um, uh, yes, I want to thank you first of all for coming here and having a speech and answering questions as well. Uh, my question goes into a kind of different direction. You were saying that peace is not, 
the absence of war. What would define peace for you, or how would you say could we move further to peace on the continuum um, instead of just having absence of war, which would be a good start, of course. So, yeah, why not? But I mean that when we speak about uh, peace solutions, so uh, also now in the issue of the Ukraine, so it's, it's of course, the question that um, not all, all, all peace agreements are, are fair. No, no, that's true. In the matter of fact, in the past, the most of them are such, such a way that they are unfair, but happily sometimes so that the both sides think that they are unfair and it's a balanced way. But um, uh, could you repeat the country where you come? Germany, okay. So you know also then very well that, that Germany, that uh, uh, the compromise what p uh, countries did in, in, uh, after the Second World War was uh, not very human. And, and so uh, we might have the similar problem now facing the Ukraine. We have had the same in Asia, Korean situation, and that we have uh, succeeded to get, I mean, the global, global community. They have succeeded to get a more stagnation of the violence, or we can say that it has been, we call sometimes it's frozen, frozen conflict. But then if we think the people who are in both sides, so, so it, it's really, it can be really very difficult. Um, so, but I think that the peace should be in such a way uh, they are not an opposite way. It, of course, it's a ceasefire. You have not the arms, you don't destroy. But if your peace is uh, just that you have not the violence, so you cannot develop the country in the way what you need to get the whole, whole society involved. But I, I'm very interested to hear also what the others will say about this, if, if not now, so continue it in the, in the working groups. That what you think that what is a minimum for the peace. I think it's like a, a peace in the Middle East. Uh, you can think in Ukraine. You can, you can think some of these long-lasting conflicts, like North and South Korea. Is it the real peace? Um, you can think also that whether the Soviet Union, which we think already that has collapsed, is this situation now with Ukraine, is it some kind of the continuation of that collapse of the Soviet Union, which they try to find their they goals? Okay. Perfect. Um, so. Okay. Okay. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Salifu. I am Cameroonian, and uh, I'm a human rights officer with the uh, UN Human Rights Office in Sudan. Yeah. And I'm a student. Congratulations. Yes, thank yeah. you. Okay. I'm a student for, at yeah. United Nations Institute for Training and Research. So my question is um, mostly regarding the United Nations, because we have seen so many uh, international organizations, such as the European, uh, European Union going through many reforms to adapt to the reality of the 21st century. But the UN since uh, its creation, mm -hmm. mainly how it's functioning, not uh, at the technical level, but at the political level, especially with the Security Council, nothing has changed. And today we have seen with the Ukrainian crisis how uh, the Secretary General was unable, I mean, to put the UN at the center of discussion. Because now uh, the one who is leading the process is NATO, which is a military organization. So from your experience, do you see that UN is still relevant in addressing the issue of peace and security in this 21st century? Uh, but, um. Okay, that's my first question. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm sure that we don't win now the Nobel Peace Prize, but okay, let's go on. 
Yeah, the next one. Yes. The, the, the second is uh, from your perspective as former head of state or government. Uh, why uh, our government, uh, I mean, why is it uh, easier for government to agree when uh, they need to go to the war? Because we have seen mobiliza mobilization in terms of providing supply arm to Ukraine and everything. But when it comes to development, people are, government are more selfish. We have seen disparity when, uh, during the COVID crisis. So why is it easier to, be, uh, to have agreement when we need to go to war than addressing so other issues like development and human rights? Thank you. Yeah. This is normally in the TV discussions, um, they will start by saying this is, these were the good questions because they try to find the time to answer. But, um, yeah, I don't know why it is so difficult. I don't, I, I don't, I think that some people have a different kind of opinion in this issue. But one thing is quite sure is that if somebody has a power, it's very, very difficult to give up the power you have. And even you know that it's not representative and it doesn't work, so, so it's very difficult to, to, to give up. What do you think about? You are the diplomat. You, you need the mic. Yeah, okay, because now I... I'm not the only diplomat. No, 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 no. <laughs> the, you are the only one I know so well. Okay, let's go. Well, uh, to this question, but also to a previous question yeah. from Malta, I would say that for my generation it was true, for your generation it's probably even more true, that the requirement for peace is not a gr an agreement between two or more countries. Mm -hmm. It is the primacy or the supremacy of the rule of law and decent development. If you have that, then you won't have a war between Finland and Denmark, or Sweden and Finland, uh, because they have the same level of development, the same aims in life. And I think that is probably one of the most important things. And you cannot create that artificially. It is the leadership, but also the populations who have to agree on such a lofty uh, purpose. I think it's a good answer also. Yeah, very good. But um, I think that perhaps I can, I can look at it also from the different point of view. Some people, they, they said already years ago that the national, uh, that, um, national states are no more important. You remember that they might say that I'm the citizen of the uh, planet, I'm a citizen of the global community. Yeah, but you can have a double or triple uh, citizenship in that way. Like you can have an, with your culture, you can have an different features. Your parents might be married, even they are not from the same faith or the same same language, uh, same national state or so. And so I think that I, myself also, I thought sometimes that what is the role of the national state? But then, openly, honestly, I think so that people feel that nation state is important. Perhaps this is the highest level way than in the many countries, many places, not all, but in the m many countries, they, they feel that they have a, some kind of shareholders uh, position that they can, for instance, at least go to the elections. Not all, but in, in, not everywhere, but anyway. And even when we have made an African Union, whether we have made an European Union or ASEAN or so, um, it can be, it can help in a way to solve the issues in so-called family circle. But still, the countries there, they are, 
very, very keen on the national interest. And, and I think that this is, this is one way, and that's why I mentioned already that I'm worried about these over-nationalistic feelings. Because if you look a little bit closer, the history, so you see that it has been always in that way. For instance, the Europe is, is the history of the wars. Even the Nordic countries, how, which now, now, now seem to be so kind of nice family, they have had a very cruel wars between each other. And um, for instance, Finland was 700 years the part of Sweden. Then the king of Sweden in 19th century made a crazy war against the Russian Tsar. They lost the eastern part of the country, and then we got an autonomy under the Russian Tsar. We were 100 years there, and then when Mr. Vladimir, when, when the Lenin, Lenin had something else to do, then we declared ourselves independent. It was quite easy, but after that, with the Stalin, it was much more difficult. But, but I mean that uh, it's, it's, of course, by chance that some people will get the independence, and so the others don't. And for instance, I remember once when I met the Chechenia leader, so he said to me, that, can you explain that why you have been already 100 years independent? And we were in the same position, and we have not yet got an independence. And I thought, what, what the hell is he speaking? And then I remember, ah, you mean the Russian Empire. Yeah, yeah, we were both uh, in the quite similar position, and you never succeeded to get an independence. And, and so uh, I don't know whether they would be better than what they are today in, the, in Ukraine, but... but um, it's not that we have been better, but we have had also good timing, good historical situation. And for instance, now if we think the Sudan, the North and South and all that. So whether they are the same state or are they, are they part of the same state or are they an independent unities? South Sudan is independent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you can ask it later on in the, in the groups. Or... Uh, so what I mean that is that people should also feel that they are the part of this society, and that's very important. But at the same time to feel that they have right to be the, the part of the bigger communities. And, and for instance, with the media, internet, and so on, and they feel their responsibility for the planet. I think it's a very complicated issue. But somehow if we think that you can have a different, different parts in your character, the same with the states. But um, I'm basically also think that uh, nation state is, is an, um, perhaps today, the biggest unity, one, one issue that you can compare to be your home. But I don't know how it is in the future. Um, for instance, if in EU we would be stronger, it could be easier for certain areas. Anybody from Spain? No? No? So uh, it would be much easier to give even more power for the, some, some um, autonomous areas in, in Spain. I'd, or it has been easier in Italy to give more power for the regional area, uh, if they feel so. But when the EU is not that strong, so, of course, it's much more important that there is a certain nation state. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I'm more working with these issues, not, not knowing how to do. But I, I hope I will learn if I have years still ahead. But um, where I think that the Guterres is very correct is that whatever is the format of this basic unit, we should uh, somehow to commit different citizens or seven billion people to understand that they have the responsibility for themselves but also for the others. And, and this, is, this is the main task. Okay, so but it I'm was interesting to listen also my old colleague in the way. <laughs> Um, so I'll just, we'll take just 
yeah, we're oh, all, we are finishing. Yeah, um, so we'll just maybe just take one or two more questions. Maybe we could take them together. Um, just and if you keep them short. Sure, thanks, Jack. Um, Emily Zal from Finland, working at ETH, running a oh, peace yeah. mediation uh, yeah. I, I, I noticed your name. Okay. Great. Um, CMI so is, is the institute which is uh, training the people for, to mediate. So he is that one you can get. <laughs> you, can, <laughs> you can put the responsibility. Yeah. Perfect. Two quick questions, one on leadership and one personal. Um, so on leadership, it's easy, I think, if you look at political leadership in today's world, around the world, to be pessimistic. Uh, but what makes you optimistic? Um, yeah. So, uh, kind of, what are any reasons for optimism in today's world when you look at political leadership around the world? And secondly, you mentioned your grandchildren in the very beginning yeah. in our program when we talk to senior people who have been involved in highly hectic processes, long days, long uh, nights in terms of work. Uh, how do you find that balance? Um, kind of uh, what I didn't. <laughs> I have a bad conscience all the so time. So, kind of what do you do to unwind yeah. okay. um, yeah. on a professional yeah. level? Uh, if I start from the, um, if I start from the last one, um, the most typical common feature in the Finnish women, and nowadays more and more also with men, is that they have all the time bad conscience. But um, my my uh, response for that has been that when you are here, be happy that you are here. Enjoy it without any bad conscience. And then when you go home, and whether you have there the husband or wife or, or children or dogs and cats and whatever, so enjoy that, that you are not here. So I, I, it has worked for me at least 50 years, so that I always thought that fantastic to be now in the parliament and I have not this dirty dishes and everything because we haven't too much uh, the domestic help. And then when I came home, I thought that now the most important is to make the pancakes. I mean that you have these sides. I mean it's 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 not uh, it's not nice. You have these sides. We can guarantee only one life for you. Some others we perhaps guarantee more, but I think we discussed today we said that we cannot guarantee more than one life. And and so take it. So um, very seldom people think when they are close to die, they don't think that why I didn't work more. They thought that why they didn't enjoy the family and friends and cults, whatever. So you have to put it in balance. But what I said that I, such kind of person who is, uh, nowadays they, they might say that it's, uh, uh, they have a certain word for that. Mikkelsen say, kutu es on niin kuin Flow, yeah. You take a flow, whatever you are doing. That's, that's, that's important. And then you stop it. That was that. And then you do it another time. But then, of course, there comes the days when you can say that in the mornings you are optimistic. And in the evenings you say that, okay, one day. But then again, um, yeah, that, that's one thing. Because it's a Leadership. Yeah, that's also the optimistic. I, uh, my predecessor's predecessor. Uh, Dr. Koivisto said always that if we don't know what to do, uh, how the things will be in the future, so it's better to believe it's well. And I mean, this is a little bit the same way, <laughs> that uh, don't make the monsters for the future. They will come anyway without asking and inviting. But think how they could be, how they could be, and enjoy the small steps. Um, of course, it's easy to say now for you, but you can imagine how we, my generation, how we felt. We thought that we can build after the Second World War more united, cooperative, uh, continent of the trust, mutual trust here in Europe. But then, in one day in February this year, it all went in toilet <laughs> like that. And uh, I do believe that we have to do it again, somehow, because otherwise we don't get the climate change stopping. We don't get this, this word of the sustainable goals. The only sad thing with me is that I don't live enough, live long enough to see the day, perhaps. But you can see it. But it doesn't come without work. You do it if you want to get it. And not only Europe, but the whole planet. 
but I trust in you. So thank you very much, and I'm, my apologies to those of you who we didn't get to um, for the questions. Um, so we talked a little bit about the importance of small states, and I think also small gestures. Um, and in that vein, we have a very small um, thank you gift um, for you. Um, so we know the Finnish designers are famous, um, so this is the Swiss rival. Um, so... Um, yeah, you don't have to open it now. <laughs> we have to be also transparent. This is one of the parts of the leadership. Okay. Um, yes, <laughs> thank you. We have the receipt, should there be any problems. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, so let's hope that that light doesn't go out. <laughs> To smell good. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, this helps the evenings. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so thank you once again um, uh, for taking the time to address our conference. Um, and uh, we'd like to invite everybody uh, who's come, there's, uh, so those of you who are in person, um, to the reception, which is just at the university uh, building, so just outside on the terrace. Um, yeah. uh, one thing more. Sometimes if you think that what has done wrongly because you don't get the good good uh, good solution. It, it's not just based on you. So it's good to remember. I always say that it's uh, good to feel the responsibility. And if it doesn't make a success, so it's not perhaps that you have made something wrong, but perhaps it's only because you have tried to do it correctly. But then you have to find a compromise also how to get the step more forward and, and then when you one day make a great victory perhaps there are some Nobel uh, Nobel award uh, receivers here so don't think that you have done it all nobody does good results all. <laughs>